is Nivedita Mahesh and I'm a grad student at the School of Earth and Space Exploration at ASU and I work with the local lab. Welcome to the ASU Open Door. I hope you'll have enjoyed a number of virtual lab tours and videos from different groups and I also hope you like what we have to show you from the local group. Let's get started. Uh, so at the local lab we have two professors five postdocs and five grad students. We are a huge group and we do a lot of collaborative work. Till 2019, we used to meet once a week in the lab as a group, get a lot of collaborative research done. The pandemic has rendered all of us at home, but we still make our work happen and we still meet over Zoom. And this is one of our lab meetings over Zoom. Yeah. So um, what is LOCO? LOCO stands for Low Frequency Cosmology. So we basically use low frequency radio waves. Uh, basically what your TV, your phone, your Wi-Fi uses. The same radiation, the same frequencies all these basic TV Wi-Fi uses. We use it, but look at the sky. And what do we study? We basically study the cosmology part of astronomy. We try to study the large scale structures of the universe, how the early structures formed and stuff like that. Let's get into a little bit of detail. What is the main science we are looking for? We are trying to study how did the very first stars of the universe form and what are their properties like? Why is this important? So astronomers know a lot about star formation. We also know a lot about the properties of the stars, which through which we know stars need metals to form. And in the early universe, we just had hydrogen, essentially. Then how did the very first stars form? And that is what we do at LOCO. So here, a quick, let's have go into the history of the universe. So I'm going to give you a nice story about our universe. Um, here I'm showing you the timeline of the history of the universe. And it spans across 13.7 billion years, roughly how old the universe is. Uh, let's understand the universe formation to understand and appreciate what we do in our lab. Uh, so the universe formation began with the Big Bang, a huge explosion, really high energetic explosion that essentially created three main particles, electron, proton and photons. Now, the like I said, the, the explosion was so energetic that these three particles, the collection of these particles, existed in a really high energy state, high dense energy state. You can imagine basically a bubble that consists of a hot, dense soup of these particles, all of them like interacting with each other. So during the initial uh, few years, the photons, which are the light particles, they want to escape this bubble. But the electrons are so energetic that they keep pushing the photons into them, keep it inside the bubble. But slowly, the universe expanded, electrons lost his energy, and the photons were free to escape. That was the moment in the universe when the first light appeared, about 400 years after Big Bang, 400,000 years after Big Bang. Um, so that was when the first light appeared. Okay, so photons escaped. What happened to electrons and protons? Now, since electrons were not busy bouncing off the photons, they combine with the protons to form the very first atom of the universe, hydrogen. So, light is escaped and hydrogen is formed. There's just hydrogen existing in the universe. So, for a very long time, nothing really interesting happened in the universe. And that period of the universe is called as the Dark Ages. Basically, hydrogen just existed. Then what happened? There were some density perturbations the hydrogen started coming, co collapsing and coming together to form the very first stars. So that's what about first stars were formed about 400 million years after Big Bang. Now what we have to remember, the stars formed in a sea of just hydrogen, right? So what happens then? The stars evolve, they emit radiation. Like we know, stars give out radiation. Now they give out radiation in this span of where just hydrogen exists. And the radiation from the stars ionize the hydrogen, that surrounding hydrogen. 
And this period, when the stars are evolving and ionizing the surrounding hydrogen, is what we call the epoch of reionization. And that's the period we want to study because this is when the stars are evolving and it's changing the signature of hydrogen. And that signal we study to study the period. This is what we're going for. How do we actually do it? What are, what are the in little things we do in our lab? We use the radio antennas, like I told you, we go for the low frequencies. So we use antennas, we use radio antennas specifically. We look for signal that is very weak. Like I told you, it's like when the first stars fall, which is about 400 million years after Big Bang, which is about 13.3 billion years back in time from now. So it's very old, it's very weak. Very important to remember that. Now, since it's weak, any man-made signal, right? Like your, I've told you, right? Your antenna, your TV antennas, your phone antennas are using the same frequencies. So any man-made signal will interfere with our study. So we design our instruments and place them in remote locations. We will show you some examples. We place them in Western Australia. We place them in South Africa, truly remote locations. Again, since it's very weak, the signal, your instrument, your receiver, your antenna also has its own noise that will interfere with the signal we're looking for. So uh, we spend or a good group or a chunk of our group and chunk of our time we spend to study the instruments we design very carefully. And then there's more, there's no problem in the signal that we're looking for. Our very own galaxy, Milky Way, also emits in the same frequency we're looking for. So a good portion of our group also studies the radio emissions from our own galaxies so that we can subtract that out from our data and look for the signal we are interested in. So with this introduction, let's quickly look over the different projects that are happening in the lab. The first one is called the EDGES. It's the experiment to detect the global EOR signature. EOR, Epoch of Reionization, remember the period of the universe. Uh, so this is located in Western Australia. Like I told you, we go to remote locations. Um, it is the size of your tabletop. This thing is just like the size of your small tabletop. Let's see. Um, it looks at the effect, like I told you, the effect of the first stars on the surrounding hydrogen. I told you, right, when the stars were forming, it was ionizing the surrounding hydrogen. It looks for that signal. The second instrument that we look uh, are using is HERA. It, this is the Hydrogen Epoch of Reionization Array and it is located in South Africa. It is a collection of radio dishes that we call an array. Like you see, it's going to be a like number of radio dishes, unlike that single experiment we saw before. Each dish is about 14 meters wide in diameter. So this is a big experiment. Uh, it is located in South Africa, like I told you. And currently, about 100 antennas have been built. Totally, we have a plan of building about 330 dishes. The next experiment is the MWA, which is the Merchants in Wide Field Array. Uh, it's an array of bow tie. So this is also an array. We have a lot of antennas. Unlike the DISH telescope, this is a bow tie. Each of these antennas is a bow tie antenna. Uh, it is, this is also in Western Australia. And it has each... The 16 of these bow tie dipoles make one patch and then there are 128 patches. So this is also a big scale project. Finally, we have the echo experiment, which is actually a drone experiment. One of my other lab mates will explain in more detail about this. It helps us to calibrate these big antennas. Now the HERA is a big 14 meter dish, right? And you need to calibrate. You need to understand, like I told you, the instrument noise, understanding the, import, um, the response of the instrument is very important for the science we're going for. So we use ECHO to study the big antenna like HERA. It uses a drone. It's a very cool project. It actually uses a drone that flies over the HERA dish. And the drone is carry, carrying a standard calibrator. This calibrator emits some signal as it flies over the dishes. And the dish collects the signal and we like compare what we need, what we expect the signal to be and what we actually get. That's how we compare and calibrate. Yeah, it flies over the uh, antenna to be studied. So these are the four major um, uh, experiments or projects that our group works on. 
uh, different people in the group work on different aspects of the project. This was an overview of what the lab does. Uh, you will now hear from my colleagues about what they specifically do. Uh, I hope you enjoy that. And if you have any questions, my email is right here. Feel free to reach out. I hope you enjoy what the rest of us have to say. Thank you. Hi, I'm David. I'm a research technician at the Low Frequency Cosmology Lab at ASU. Uh, we create and observe with instruments designed to see the universe in radio wavelengths. One of these instruments is the experiment to detect the global EOR signal, or EDGES, and it's in Western Australia at the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory. With EDGES, we're looking for a signal created when the first stars formed and began to shine. Along with other members of the project, I write code and perform analysis on EDGES as we continue to refine the instrument. I use some of the data we've taken and look for recombination lines, little, little spikes or dips in the signal of certain frequencies, and analyze how these signals can affect the larger search for the reionization signal. One of the other projects I'm working with is the External Calibrator for Hydrogen Observatories, or ECHO. ECHO is a drone platform that carries a radio transmitter designed to be flown over and around radio observatories to calibrate them against the known signal. To design and use ECHO, we use some programs to model electromagnetic fields and antennas, as well as writing our own code in Python. I work with the rest of the team writing code and analysis, as well as creating and maintaining software environments to let us take our analysis software to more powerful supercomputers. If you have any questions about these projects, please feel free to let me know. Thank you for watching. Hi everyone, my name is Nru. I'm a second year PhD student at the School of Earth and Space Exploration. And my primary research is at the Low Frequency Cosmology Lab. I'm going to give you an overview of my research project. My research explores the use of drones to calibrate modern radio telescopes. And I'm going to give you an overview of that today. You might be familiar with uh, traditional radio telescopes that look like uh, big satellite dishes. Uh, this one here is the very large array at New Mexico. This also featured in the movie Contact, if you have seen. And uh, this one is the Arecibo. If you've been following the news, Arecibo is unfortunately went through a lot of damage this year. Uh, this one is called the Green Bank Telescope and is at West Virginia. The VLA and the Green Bank Telescope is still uh, working and working very well, I, I must say. However, uh, modern day radio telescopes look like this. These are uh, small uh, antennas on the ground. Uh, this, one's, this one is in Western Australia. This one is actually in California. Uh, it's called the Long Wavelength Array. And we also have another array in South Africa, which is called HERA. So these are the telescopes I work on. And uh, we explore the use of drones to calibrate them. When I say calibrate, I mean uh, study the response, res response of each of these antennas. Here's a quick overview of uh, our uh, system. So ECHO stands for External Calibration of Hydrogen Observatories. Uh, these observatories are hydrogen observatories. And uh, the system basically consists of a drone and a known calibration signal. It is flown around the antenna and the test, and it transmits a known signal and also transmits its GPS locations. And at every single position we study, we also record the response of the antenna under test. That's how we uh, study the response of the antenna. And uh, we're trying to uh, learn how to use this system to calibrate radio telescopes. I'll leave you with saying that ECHO is a fully open source uh, project and uh, you can find the code and the hardware and also the documentation on the links uh, you're seeing over here. Thank you for Hi. joining. Uh, my name is Stephen Murray. I work in the Low Frequency Cosmology or LOCO lab at, uh, in CC. And I work uh, predominantly, my main interest is to detect and understand the very first stars and universe 
uh, and, and galaxies in the early universe, about 13 billion years ago. Uh, we do this uh, using radio telescopes. So these are telescopes that look uh, look at the sky between the frequencies of about 50 to one, uh, 250 megahertz, encompassing that uh, FM band um, of, of the radio. Uh, and so what we expect is that the neutral hydrogen, which was very abundant in the, in the early universe, emits at these frequencies uh, and we can we can detect that signature from the early universe which tells us something about the stars and galaxies that are forming from that gas and 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 um, and burning out and and uh, heating up the gas around it. it it affects the signature that we see however doing this is really really difficult um, as i said we use radio telescopes i use uh, in particular one uh, a very large radio telescope that's currently being constructed in south africa called hera uh, and another telescope that I use is a, is a single single antenna uh, in located in Australia, which which does a, a different kind of experiment, but looking at the same kinds of science. And in particular, my job and my my interest, uh, what I do on a daily day to day basis, is uh, to try to verify that what we're actually seeing uh, in our data is what we what we want to see. So what we're seeing is is actual the first stars and galaxies, that, that signature that from, from cosmology, rather than uh, all of the different sources that interfere. For example, other galaxies, our own galaxy, the radio that's on Earth, or our antennas themselves um, can create interference. And so trying to statistically verify that we're, we're understanding the right thing, that we're not uh, getting artifacts in our data, and things like that is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, using statistics, numerical simulations, and the like. Uh, thank you for listening. Hello, Professor Danny Jacobs here from ASU's Low Frequency Cosmology Lab. Our uh, main science experiment is trying to see the, uh, the evidence of star formation at the very beginning of the universe. Uh, the universe is commonly known to be large. In fact, so stupendously large that you can't imagine how big it is. The Earth is but one drop in the cosmic ocean and so on. A galaxy is, uh, is huge, and there are many, many, many billions of them. If the universe were one meter wide, you would be smaller than the nucleus of an atom, and so on. It's huge. However, it's not so big if you think about the fourth dimension. Consider, the universe is 13.8 <clears throat> billion years old. Suppose each foot on this tape measure were a billion years. We only need 13... 0.8 of them to represent a timeline of the universe. The Earth, known to be about four and a half billion years old. So that's uh, right about here. It's a good chunk of the timeline Earth has been around. Big Bang, some stuff, star formation, galaxies form Earth. It's the, it's similar in size scale. The Earth is cosmically old, and, uh, and we live on it. So let's take care of it.